is up guys, welcome back to another GeekerWatt video and today I'm going to be showing you how to put together a $750 gaming PC build for 2020. I'm going to run you through all the parts I selected and why, the build process step by step from start to finish, including all the fiddly cables before booting this machine up to see exactly how it performs in some of the most popular titles. So let's jump into it. But first, a quick ad from today's video sponsor, Harry's. Do you find it annoying paying over the odds for poor quality razors that irritate your skin? Well, the founders of Harry's, Jeff and Andy did, they were fed up with overpaying, so they bought a razor factory in Germany and started Harry's. What a backstory. They've sent over their trial set, which includes a grippy handle, a five blade cartridge, plus foaming shave gel and a little travel cover for when you're on the move. They've just launched their sharpest blades ever with refills as low as just $2 each. Their sharp, durable blades are backed by Harry's close and comfortable shave guarantee, so what's not to love? Plus, 1% of their sales go to non-profit organisations, supporting mental health care to men in need. Grab your trial set for just $3 by clicking the link in the description below. Genuinely, the deal Harry's currently have on their trial set is great. It's got everything you need for a close and comfortable shave. Thanks again to Harry's for making today's video possible. Now, as always, I'm going to kick things off by installing our CP you into the motherboard. This is AMD's Ryzen 3 3100, boosting from 3.6 up to 3.9 gigahertz with four cores and eight threads. It's a great budget option. I'm going to be installing it into this B550M Mortar motherboard. You may also want to explore some B450 options which are a little bit cheaper, but this motherboard as it stands is really really well future-proofed for future CPU releases. I'm going to stick with the stock cooler today, which comes included for free with our CPU, and we're gonna screw this down corner by corner in a cross pattern just like so. Finally, you want to take the four pin PWM fan connector and plug this up to the CPU fan header on our motherboard. The final thing to pop into the motherboard assembly is our RAM today, and this is Corsair's Vengeance LPX, specifically a 16 gigabyte kit. This is super easy to install by pulling back the clips on the second and fourth dim slots and sliding the RAM into place. Lovely jubbly. Next up then, I'm gonna install the motherboard into our case choice today. This is from MSI, and this is their Gunyear 110R. It's actually one of the best budget cases I've seen on the market with a few addressable RGB fans, and of course, a lovely tempered glass side panel and the motherboard is going to slide nice and easily into place and the motherboard's raised center standoff is going to hold it in place so we can screw it in with these included motherboard screws that MSI kindly provide with this chassis. All right then with the motherboard in next up we're going to install the graphics card and I've actually selected an Nvidia GTX 1660 Super today. While it's true that AMD do have some great budget options out there the 5600 XT is a great example the 1660 Super is a really powerful card and you get some of Nvidia great features like game recording and streaming built in in this great package with this really nice MSI twin fan design that comes overclocked out of the box. All you then need to do is remove this bracket at the back of the case and we're also going to make sure that the first and second PCIe slots have been removed so that we can slide the graphics card nice and easily into place. You're then going to use one of these screws in order to secure the graphics card into place and make sure that, you know, it doesn't fall out or something along those lines. Before we go ahead and install our storage today, it makes sense to do some of our cables and the wiring, namely our front panel connectors and then our power supply in just a moment's time. The first of those cables is our HD audio connector, which goes to the bottom left of the motherboard, just like so. Next up is our JFP1 front panel connections, and these go to the bottom right of the motherboard. They can be a bit fiddly, and if you get them the wrong way around, don't worry. Your power button just isn't gonna work. Nothing will explode, nothing will, you know, catch fire, so don't panic. The final two cables to plug in are our USB 3.0 and our 3.1 Gen 2 Type-C, 
There has got to be a better name for that connector, which go to the right hand side of the motherboard. They are a bit delicate, so you know, be careful, don't force them. But they're not they're not too difficult. While we're on the theme of cables and wiring, it makes sense to install. Whoa! <laughs> it makes sense to install the power supply. This is an 80 plus bronze certified unit from AeroCool. It's got all black cables and is pretty affordably priced, but I'll link all the components today in the description below. And this is gonna slide into the case fan facing downwards. And then all we need to do is pop in an eight pin GPU power connector, just like so, a four plus four pin CPU power connector to the top left of our motherboard. And then the biggest cable of all, the 24 pin motherboard power cable, which goes to the upper right hand side of the motherboard and clips in pretty easily. All that then leaves to do in terms of the build process is install our storage today. And this is Kingston's A400 SSD. By no means the quickest SSD around, but it's gonna be a lot faster than pretty much any hard drive option out there. Spin the case around once again and remove this SSD mount on the rear of the case. And this is gonna sit onto the top of the mount and screw in from the bottom side. And we're also gonna run a SATA power and data cable to the bottom of the drive, just like so, with the other end of the data cable going to our motherboard. And this does come included in your motherboard's box. And all that's left to do then really is to whack both the side panels on and then boot this machine up to see how it looks, but more importantly, how it performs. Roll the montage. Okay then, now you've seen just how good this system looks when it's all powered up and of course the process of putting it together step by step, let's see exactly how it performs in eight of the most popular titles, including some of the latest AAA titles and then also some slightly older but still really popular games. First up is GTA 5. I ran Grand Theft Auto at 1440p with a cross between medium and high settings, essentially using high settings for the toggles and then having the kind of render bars, the linear scales are around about halfway. And with the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode, you're looking at an average of 95 frames per second with a 90th and 99th percentile of 84 and 76 respectively. For GTA 5, this is really good and at 1440p, the game looks pretty fantastic if I do say so myself. Of course, this was the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode, so if you want to go back and compare my previous builds, it's really easy to do so. Next up is Apex Legends, one of the most popular battle royale titles out there right now. And here at 1080p medium, so trying to, you know, really go for some competitive settings, we're looking 129 frames per second on average, with a 90 and 99th percentile result of 111 and 104 FPS respectively. Once again, Apex Legends looks fantastic. We got really close to the W, but, but didn't, didn't quite clutch it. Uh, and the game runs really, really smoothly at over 100 FPS pretty much the entire time, which is a really impressive result. Next up then is Call of Duty's Warzone. Here at 1080p medium to high settings, once again going for kind of high settings uh, for some of the less intensive options and then medium for like the ambient occlusion and motion blur to really give us that best possible frame rate. And here we're looking at an average of 94 frames per second with 90th and 99th percentile results of 80 and 70 respectively. The game was really smooth, no lag, no major screen tearing or anything like that with of course the likes of V-Sync disabled. Next up then is Forza Horizon 4. One of the easier games to run today, but something that looks visually fantastic is a boatload of fun. And for a bit of context, we'll usually run around about 45 FPS on a console. Here we're looking at an average of 121 frames per second with 90 and 99th percentile results of 112 and 97 FPS respectively. Once again, this is the game's inbuilt benchmarking mode. I try and use that benchmark mode in all the titles uh, where it, you know, where it exists, where it's a feature uh, and really, really impressive stuff from Forza here. 
Next up then today is Overwatch. Here at 1440p ultra settings, we're really pushing the boat out. You're looking at 130 FPS for your average with 123 and 120 for the 90th and 99th percentile results. Really, really consistent frame rates, a visual experience that looks fantastic, is pretty unparalleled even in some of the newer titles and a boatload of fun. I mean, who doesn't love Overwatch? Next up then is CSGO, another game today that's slightly easier to run, but who doesn't love it? Going for some more competitive settings, again, you guys always ask for that. 1080p high settings, you're looking at an average of 272 frames per second. That is surely high enough to satisfy even the most frame-hungry gamers out there. And once again, considering it's CSGO and it's quite a few years old now, the game looked visually pretty fantastic. Finally then, the last title on my list today is Fortnite. Here at 1080p high settings with of course no RTX or DLSS uh, due to the lack of an RTX graphics card using a GTX card today instead, you're looking at an average of 121 FPS with a 90 and 99th percentile frame rate result of 99 and 80 respectively. The game looked great as you would expect and these really high frame rates are bound to suit even the most esports competitive gamers out there. Drop it down to 1080p low and I'm sure you could get well over 200 FPS. But if you want a good frame rate and a great visual experience, these are the settings I'd recommend. With that being said though, that not only wraps it up for Fortnite and the gaming benchmarks today, but the whole video. If you did enjoy it, make sure to give it a big old like rating and get subscribed. Follow me on Twitter, Instagram, all that good stuff will be linked in the description below. And as always, we'll see you in the next one.